Have you ever been in a cafe in Ubud, heard someone talking about how activated their sacral chakra is, and wish you knew what they were talking about? Well, fear not, because neither do they. They're just a member of howtospeakyoga.com. Learn phrases such as, my third eye is buzzing right now, is there something you need to tell me? And that person is so still in the 3D. Conversation starters such as, when I had my kundalini awakening, Wow, I love your energy. I'm so guided to give you a yoni massage right now. Never have to take responsibility for your actions with responses such as, I feel like you're just projecting right now. This negative energy you're giving out isn't compatible with the frequency I'm vibrating at. And sorry I didn't respect your physical boundaries, I was just in my dark masculine. <laughs> Master the secret technique of taking long sighs before you say <sighs> anything. And don't worry, if you ever happen to meet someone who actually knows about yoga and they question you about it, just say it's ancient downloads and that they're just not ascended enough in the 5D to understand. Howtospeakyoga.com Because who actually does the work anymore? Above all, for a game worth playing. Oh, baby, this craft contagious. I felt it for ages. We're out of these cages in this house and mages. It's witchcraft, it's dangerous. Beware of these pages. There's spells of all flavors in this. Hello and welcome to this episode of Make Yoga Magic Again, the House of Mages podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Arulian Cumming. This episode will be a little bit of an intro dive into what I would consider the goal or goals of yoga and tantra. Now, this is a tricky one because if you look at the different lineages of both yoga and tantra and even the individual practitioners of the same lineage, everyone had a slightly different opinion on what the goals were, the values and the hierarchy of, of um, different practices and different signposts to let you know that you've made progress. And so what I can only really do is share my experience in this and share personally what I'm trying to achieve and how I go about that. And then this is also a really good introduction to what we focus on as a school here in both the House of Mages, but especially in the Ritual Embodiment Tantric Yoga Teacher Training Program. Because Tantra and yoga, there's <laughs> so many different uh, versions and practices and lineages and, you know, there's like a, a saying, I can't remember where it originated, but to learn the whole spectrum of Tantra, you need to have, have you know, do it in like, say, 20 something lifetimes and then also be remembering everything you've learned each lifetime and dedicating the entirety of each lifetime to doing it. So in summary, it's not that easy to, to delve into all of it. And I don't think you need to delve into all of it because it really comes down to what you're trying to achieve and what are the best tools to help you do that while keeping it simple and not overloading yourself. Um, and I'm really grateful that I've had the backgrounds of both martial arts and um, magical work as well, ceremonial and um, ritual magical work, because they've both shown me that changing your operating system and changing your viewpoint changes how you yeah, interact with the world and changes the possibilities and capabilities of what you're doing. So, for example, from a martial arts perspective, you're changing your movement system to suit a certain type of goal, which in martial arts is obviously defending yourself and taking down the other person as soon as possible. And so what you're trying to do is 
configure your movement patterns to suit a particular way of doing this. And yeah, some martial arts just aren't very compatible. Like the Tai Chi, for example, and Wing Chun, they're both under the you know kind of Chinese uh, Kung Fu type of category, but they have very different ways of doing it and often don't really overlap very well. And the same goes for different cultural frameworks in that, for example, if you're trying to work with, you know, the, say the Hermetic, um, well, Hermetic probably isn't a good example because Hermetic uh, magical practices actually are <laughs> um, succeeding in mixing things together, but they do it in a particular way. But yeah, the way that different people from different cultural backgrounds view the cosmos, view the soul, view different deities, view different ways to interact with the cosmos, the framework, and your own soul um, is slightly different. There definitely is some overlaps, but what we want to do, or you know, what I want to do and what I recommend people doing, and I, I try to as best to teach, is to build one cohesive framework that you can kind of have as your default, because whether we believe it or not, all of us have a default framework. And what I mean by framework or a par paradigm, I know I'm using a lot of uh, technical words here, but what I'm trying to explain is the way that you interact with the world and with people is depending on what uh, belief system you've grown up with. And a lot of people would say, oh, I don't, I don't have any particular re uh, religion. I don't have a belief system. But you do. Uh, and whether that, and that's probably a mishmash of whatever your parents believed or whoever raised you believed. Uh, and a lot of what we've seen on TV, books with red, um, which are highly influenced uh, by certain types of religions and certain type of beliefs. And so, yeah, and even our pop, pop culture, which is under the same category, we've built this belief system of what we see the world as, what's possible, what's not possible. Some people's ideas of this are more fixed um, and some people's ideas of these are a little bit more open and loose. Um, so that's a bit of a spectrum. It's like, no, I 100% believe that this is the way the world is. Or some people are basically open to anything that you tell them. Um, each day, they'll have a completely different belief system. you know. And I, I, ideally, I think we want a bit of a balance. Um, but also, tr so, so we've established one of the goals is to, you know, to circle back, what are the goals of yoga and tantra? And I'll kind of break down the difference with differences um, between yoga and Tantra as well. Um, but yeah, so one of, one of the main goals is to create a cohesive framework of how we interact with the world. So why would we want to do that? Because it then gives us a language to start communicating and start acting in particular ways to test if our idea of, of the world is a right one. And it might sound weird to some people, you know, to, to say, you know, you might be saying, of course, you know, the way that I interact with the world works, why wouldn't it work? Well, what I mean by that is, you know, what about beliefs of when you die? Yeah. So that's like the quickest way I can start to explain because we don't know. You might have a definite idea, but none of us really know. And so a lot of religions, a lot of cultural beliefs and, and frameworks are, are kind of based around this idea of what the world is based on what they believe will happen when you die, because that is the ultimate unknown. And so then we get into concepts of the soul and what is reality and are like deities or are gods and goddesses real? Is there just one God? Like if there is one God, what actually is it? And these are all huge questions and each of them deserve a podcast to themselves. And I am, I am doing that gradually, especially on the last subject there. Um, I've got a really good uh, one that I'm, I'm going to be bringing out soon to just give my perspective on that. But yeah, so we're, we're trying to build, uh, yeah, and I'm just, just trying to, <laughs> as usual, I have my mind's going in so many different directions at once, and I'm, I'm just trying to cover it all in a succinct, uh, somewhat ordered manner, so bear with me. Um, but yeah, again, why would we want to do that? Because if anyone has explored multiple paths at the same time, whether that's multiple martial arts, right? So an example, like an analogy I like, you know, imagine you're learning 
different martial arts or even working with different weapons, for example, is, is another good analogy. And yeah, I just ask you to, again, bear with if you don't like weapons or martial arts, if you have something against them, it's just an analogy. But I want you to maybe imagine that there's two people that are put into an arena and they have to fight, right? Now, one person has uh, done five years of practice with a sword and five years of practice with a spear and five years of practice with a bow and five years of practice, practice with a trident and five years of practice with some other weapon, right? So about 30 years practice, uh, let's say five years each. And then you've got uh, one other person who's only done uh, 10 years of practice, but they've done it all with a sword, let's say. Uh, and then they put into the arena. And who do you think is going to win? Well, you know, you might say that it doesn't even end up in a proper fight because, well, the other person is, you know, who's had 30 years experience is trying to decide which weapon to use. The person who had only trained with a sword instantly grabs a sword because they just know that that's what they use, that's what they're good at, and then they win, they strike the other person down, yeah? But even in the other case, if they had chosen a weapon, they would probably uh, have lost anyway because uh, the other person has double the experience um, in their skill, right? And I'm not saying to, yeah, it's, it's tricky here because yes, I'm definitely saying that no matter what you do, as long as you uh, have one main structure or one main thing, then you can build from that. But that also is very risky because then you're looking at getting into a very limited worldview and a very dogmatic worldview. So dogmatism or dogma or being dogmatic essentially means that you reject whatever doesn't fit into your belief system. So yeah, if for example, you believe that there was just one supreme uh, deity, one supreme god or goddess or whatever you want to believe, um, and that anything else with, was either false or even evil or bad, right? So if I told you that I was working with a deity called Ganesha, um, and whether I told you I actually believed in the literal existence of, of Ganesha or, you know, lots of different things, you, you'd outright reject it. Or if you didn't believe that there's anything outside the five senses, then you wouldn't believe either of these people. Um, but I might be able to talk with you about seeing me working with Ganesha, for example, as an archetype, as like a psychological kind of archetypal awareness of a certain part of myself that embodies, that I want to embody more, um, you know, discipline, more playfulness, more like embodiment, like more connection to my body. And so you might agree with this, but then someone who believes it to be a literal deity, you might not believe it. But also like, what is the difference too? Because a lot of people don't ask each other questions. They're like, no, I don't believe that. Um, they, they just outright reject other people's beliefs and ideas rather than be like, what do you actually mean by that? I remember, um, traveling Iceland and I met this guy from uh, from America and it was just very coincidental that we both ended up in the same like Airbnb hostel thing. He wanted to see all the stuff that I wanted to see. He'd hired a car. Awesome guy. I haven't seen him since, but we spent like three days together uh, just driving around, barely any sleep, um, exploring as much of Iceland we could see. It was amazing. And we had some great conversations. I remember me and him sitting uh, like on top of this waterfall, just overlooking everything. And he was brought up like very, very Christian, very Orthodox Christian. Um, I can't remember exactly what, uh, what lineage of Christianity he was um, from, but yeah, essentially like what I was talking to him, cause this was uh, four or five years ago and I was, I still am, but at the time I was very, very much focused on the runes and um, Norse myth. And um, yeah, I had mixed views of the reality of things, but um, yeah, I was just very into that. And I guess, yeah, I was talking to him about it because I, that's where I went to Iceland in the first place because I wanted to go and see if there was any people that still believed in like the, like Ozatru and, um, you know, 
Iceland is, is really cool because they've got certain laws there that you can't develop on parts of the land because um, because of the elves, because of the, the hidden folk, the, the hidden folk, basically, um, you know, land whites, land spirits and stuff like that. So, yeah, you're not allowed to develop on certain parts of the land there because you um, essentially don't want to piss off the, the land spirits, which I think is really cool. And people have built little mini... Uh, homes for them and stuff like that for the elves. If you've ever seen um, that Will Ferrell movie, it, it like it's set in Iceland and it's really funny, like the way they like uh, make jokes about the elves and stuff. Yeah, highly recommend. Big tangent. But one of the conversations that we had, I remember him just saying one thing, and I didn't even mean for this to happen. It was just because he was curious because, like, about Norse mythology because he'd never really heard much about it. And I was like talking about the history and how like kind of heathenism um, slash paganism kind of got, uh, you know, how it related to Christianity and Catholicism, just the history of how things changed and evolved. Um, and I was talking to him about Norse myth and about Odin, you know, being the all father and, you know, uh, it's Odin's relation to the other gods and goddesses in the pantheon and he's like oh so like how you um you would view odin is kind of like how i view god so essentially like odin is kind of like god um and i was like oh i you know i didn't really think of it like that but yeah i guess in a you know i wouldn't you know i'm hesitant to just copy paste things like that but um i just liked that because you know he, it was so new to him and he, you could tell like, cause of his, uh, the way he was raised, he was so resistant to it. But, um, for him to be able to get that realization and be like, oh, okay. So because I've asked questions, I see that like, essentially we're having the same ex similar experience, just, we call it different things, you know? And I think it's a bit more complicated than that, but I think that was such a, such a beautiful moment. And I don't think enough people yeah, I mean, I think if any, like, two humans spend some quality time together and, you know, actually open up a conversation, we'll all see that we all probably think very similarly. We just have different labels and different colours and, um, you know, different ideas around it. So, ultimately, it would be awesome if we can try to have a view or, like, a perspective or way of operating in the world that also allows for many or even all different uh, other spiritual beliefs, right? I mean, that would be the ideal. It's difficult because some directly say that theirs is the only way of perceiving the world, and that's theirs is the truth. And I find those kind of systems very problematic because it leaves no space for anything else to exist it says no we're right you're wrong um and you know some are doing that a little bit more peacefully saying we're right, we believe we're right and you're wrong but you know you can do your own thing but some are actually actively trying to make sure that no one else ever believes anything else and again that's a whole nother conversation but what I'm trying to do through Tantra, both in my own practice and uh, what I'm teaching people through Tantra, is inviting them to a perspective of the universe and the world that can include most. It can include anything else, as long as that anything else doesn't, yeah, essentially doesn't say that the other thing can't exist, if that makes sense. So if I have a perspective of the world that says that everything is essentially from the same mysterious source, that, you know, you and I are all essentially experiencing each other as part of the same consciousness or same being or same essence or same, same thing, mysterious thing that, um, all of this has sprung from. That could, in theory, allow for anyone else having a different perspective because it acknowledges that we're all having a slightly different uh, experience of the same thing. But if one of those people having an experience that differs from other people says that theirs is the truth and our, others aren't, then you, I don't know, hopefully you can see how that would just invalidate everything else and then they, the two can't coexist. And so, yeah, I'm, 
I guess I'm just trying to give people a framework that can be applied because I believe this framework could be applied even to, to Christianity. It could be applied to, you'd obviously have to shift certain things, but what I'm doing in my own research as well on different uh, religions and how they evolved, which I'm still very early on and I'll, I'll share some stuff um, hopefully in the next six months or so when I've, I've researched into it a bit more deeply. Um, but there's even some, yes, let's say Christian traditions that have a bit more of a tantric viewpoint uh, rather than a we're right, you're wrong. And what I, when I say tantric viewpoint is it's more inclusive of just seeing things slightly differently. But in saying that, even in some lineages and traditions of tantra and yoga, um, they were still and are still very close, I wouldn't say closed minded, but a bit more dualistic. And what I mean by dualistic and non-dualistic, because my version of Tantra is non-dual Shaiva Tantra. And so the non-dual approach is more saying that there's no right or wrong, it's just a slightly different approach. Whereas dualism would more so say, yes, there is a right, there is a wrong and apply that overall to everything. So before we get into the actual framework and structure that I teach and that I use and I think is a really good template for pretty much anyone to learn and use uh, no matter what your cultural background or tradition or even aims because it does help and enhance any other uh, work or spiritual work or yogic work or magical tradition that you're doing. But before I do that, I just wanted to try my best to give you a little opening to differentiating between Tantra and yoga because they are very interlinked. Yoga is older than Tantra from our records and Tantra generally evolved out of yoga in a bit of a rebellion towards a renunciate yoga-based path, which was basically stepping out of society, um, living in the woods and um, yeah, even renouncing, renouncing uh, usual clothing and just meditating and trying to escape physical reality and seeing physical reality as like a not so great thing. Whereas Tantra is about unifying and yeah, and essentially not seeing spirit and matter as separate as seeing everything as part of the same divine essence. And Tantra is essentially saying that we can have a physical experience, that we were meant to have a physical experience, that this, this realm is the playground, is where the party's at, is the experience, and that spirit is intertwined with everything, and that, yeah, sex isn't anti-spiritual and that yeah and nothing is essentially anti-spiritual because it is all part of the same uh, divine essence so to speak if that makes sense hopefully that makes sense it's it's obviously a, a bit of a difficult thing to explain it's a you can try to intellectualize it but it, it's something that really needs to be kind of felt and em, embodied uh, have an embodied experience of to um to kind of get, if you can even get it. <laughs> so like I mentioned, there's quite a few things I'm saying here that could be unpacked so much more, um, especially the connection between, uh, say, sacred sexuality and Tantra or Neo-Tantra. Um, that is in another podcast that I can link um, on this. But for now, I really just want to get into now the framework. So if I had to give a little summary of the differences as I currently perceive uh, between yoga and Tantra. I would say that yoga is more of a universal technology that can be used to embody more of and to discover and uh, dive into a particular belief system or tradition uh, more fully and more effectively. And because I've heard uh, yoga called um, optionally theistic, meaning that there was even atheists that did yoga that didn't that essentially had a very similar belief system to um, atheists that did yoga, and so yeah, it can just be a set of practices to live a better life and to also dive deeper into whatever belief system. But tantra is 
kind of like a lens or belief system in itself, which I guess is putting it more into like religion territory, but I feel like the main thing that it distinguishes it from a religion is that it is a bit more inclusive in that it can al almost like be a lens, an additional lens that can be applied to any religion nearly um, to give it a slightly different uh, flavor and a more inclusive flavor and I think a more fun and, and playful and uh, um, yeah, more embodied flavor to it. Tantra especially focuses on mantra and the connection and work with deities, at least in my lineage it does. Um, but again, there's so many different flavors and lineage of, of it. And um, yeah, I won't get too much into the historical stuff around that. I'll kind of leave that for now. And now I just want to dive into uh, what do we focus on in the Ritual Embodiment Yoga Teacher Training as the framework. So there's a few different parts of it. Ultimately, from a practical level, and I think everything should come down to a practical level. And what I mean by that is, you know, what good is it in the world? And like, why are we doing things like this? Is because I feel like there's, everyone's experienced these at least two parts of ourselves. There's the part of ourself that has the idea and wants to do the thing, like, oh, I wanna start eating a little bit differently because I haven't been feeling good or I'm not happy with my body or I wanna start doing yoga or I wanna start getting up earlier or I wanna um, pursue this uh, hobby or I wanna learn this instrument, etc. right? We all have these ideas and we have these realizations that this is something that we really, really desire and we wanna do. Yet, why don't we do it? Why is it so difficult that once we decide we want to do something, how come we can't, how come we can't just do it? If we're in control of ourselves and we decide we want to do something, how come it doesn't just happen? How come it isn't easy? And that's the other side of us. It's, it's the autonomous part of us. It's like almost like this machine autopilot part of ourselves that is already in momentum doing a bunch of other things before that and doesn't want to change. And so even though people kind of realize this on some sort of level, they don't really acknowledge it or don't understand how to work with these two parts of themselves. And using a framework such as Tantra and, and our the ritual embodiment framework that is based heavily on tra traditional Tantric uh, viewpoints and the one of the original chakra systems, the five element chakra system, um, which you know is is much much older than the modern twentieth century seven rainbow chakra system, which I did a completely different podcast about. If you want to dive into that, but the first way that we start to unpack this and give us the ability to understand what is happening here is with what we call the three bodies or the three bindus is where we kind of start with all this. And a good way that I can start to explain this concept is whatever you're doing right now. So, you know, whether you're driving or uh, sitting down or walking, I just want you to be able to lift your one arm up above your head, right? So I'd ask you to think about raising your arm up without actually turning on any of your muscles, without any of your muscles actually being activated in your body, right? So I want you to think about lifting one of your arms up in the air without, or maybe your foot up in the air, Not definitely not your pedal foot if you're driving. <laughs> you know, and you probably think that's stupid, right? Because, okay, I can think about it, but nothing's gonna happen unless I activate my muscles. So you might say, okay, so we've got our awareness body now, our two bodies, so our awareness is us thinking about it, being aware of what we're trying to do. And then we have our physical body, which is actually doing the thing. So you might be like, okay, well, if it's not me thinking about it that's making the action, then it must be my physical body that makes the action. Duh, it must be that. So, okay, I want you to lift one hand up. So get your body to lift one of its hands up without thinking about it. So I want you to lift one of your hands up without thinking about it. So I've had people in classes and things just, you know, randomly throw their arm up and they're like, oh, I didn't think about it, but you, you probably did. I mean, what, what made the arm, you know, wasn't involuntary. It, it, you thought about it, you were intending it there and you tried to kind of like drop it into, so you're on the right track. You tried to make it like a, you do it randomly, but you still were thinking about it in order to do it. So if it's not your awareness that is, you know, making your arm lift up, 
and it's not your physical body and your muscles making your arm lift up by itself, then what's happening? It's obviously a mix between the two, but what's happening in between? It's like you could, it's the energy body. And the word energy gets thrown out around a lot. It's like, oh, I can feel the, the energy. And it's essentially the signals that are, that are going between things. And so in the human body, we think about an action and then our brain sends an electrical signal to that body to actually do that. So it's electricity. It's, it's, it's literally electricity running through your body and, and contracting muscles in order for that to happen. And so it is all three working together in tandem. And so these three bodies are always working together in tandem to some extent. But in order to learn something, to really learn how to master something, we need to break it down into different bits. Uh, I've explained this um, in the teacher training. I explain even like a, you know, you obviously can't see me, but if you've seen like, you know, the whole uh, waving of arms or like breakdancing kind of thing, you see when, you know, people's arms turn into this wave-like motion. You know, someone trying to learn that and be like, what are they doing? But if you break it down into little segments of just raising your, say if you raise your shoulder, your elbow, your wrist, and then your fingertips. So you break it down into four parts. And then once you learn these little little compartmentalized versions of it, then you put it back all together and it's so much more fluid and integrated and you understand how it's all working as a whole because you broke it down into smaller parts. So that's what we're doing. We're essentially breaking ourselves down into different parts in order to be able to work with it on a practical level and to understand it. And, you know, the energy body, which is essentially the main work, like anything we're doing, whether it's like with chakras, elements, uh, whether it's like uh, breath work, everything is essentially like magic in general, a magical framework or belief system, religion. It's all working with the energy body which is essentially how our belief in what the world is and what we can do in this world and with our body affects the physical world. So we start off with seeing there's a communication needed between the awareness part of ourself and our actual physical part of ourself and getting things done in the world and achieving things and growing. And this is done by the energy body. So we have the three integral bindus, which is like kind of like the core chakras or the core essence of chakras. And in Tantra, any chakra system, because there's actually lots of different chakra systems, are stemming from these three main bindus because they are also like experientially uh, felt parts of ourselves, whatever our belief system, because they're located in the head, in the heart space, and then in the lower belly. And so you could say you experience, you know, uh, say, you know, gut feelings, or even down towards more of the general area, like with, with sexual experiences, we know we all have experiences down this lower part of the body that relate to these kind of things. Um, and then we have like hard experiences, whether your love or heartbreak, you know, we have full like embodied experiences of these. And with our awareness, with thinking and focusing on things, you know, you could even like kind of like focus and furrow your eyebrows together and clench your face up a little bit because you're super focused. And so these are where they have, um, yeah, placed or like, you know, conceptualized these ideas from. Um, and this is where the ideas of chakras come from as well, from, uh, from, the, from the essence of the bindus, the three main bindus. So then we split that again into six. We split that three into six layers. So these six layers or these five plus one layers, depending on how you view them and the lineage, can also be called koshas. I don't generally call them koshas now, mainly because the tantric lineage that I uh, adopted these from is highly influenced by Christopher Wallace. And he wrote about that this koshas model, this layers model is actually the more traditional koshas, but because Vedanta ended up creating its own koshas model later, apparently, I highly recommend reading Christopher Wallace's books and scholarship around this, but because most people know that model as the koshas and teach that model as the koshas, it's just confusing now. And so uh, Chris Wallace more calls it the, the layers. And that's where I've got the name of the layers from. And it is good because it kind of shows that it's not separate uh, realms or even though I do call them realms as well, but it's just different layers and they all kind of are connected and interlaced. And I won't go 
deeply into what these are, but essentially we start off with the more physical layers, how we experience the world and the five senses. Uh, and then we go a little bit deeper and we start to um, experience mind and emotions. And yogis didn't really see these as different things because they kind of very interlinked that emotions usually come from thoughts and thoughts come from emotions. It's this back and forth. I talked about a little bit more about this before in other podcasts. And then we go a little bit deeper and we get into the subconscious realms. And this is like the archetypal and stuff to do with um, exploring what we do when we sleep. And this is what Yoga Nidra is really diving into. Um, you know, getting into these unconscious, subconscious layers where this is deeper parts of ourselves. This is like where we get into astrology, um, yeah, and archetypal ideas. And then we go a little bit deeper into the layers and lose more of our personality, what a lot of people will call ego. But, you know, what's left after we strip all this away? And it's this pure awareness. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's obviously, <laughs> you know, it sounds like a, a straightforward thing, but it's not at all. It's like a lifetime or lifetimes of, of journeying through this. But this is what we are essentially doing because once we unpack everything, then we can see that we actually are not having to, it's like doing a Marie Kondo of your entire soul or, or being and being like, wow, I didn't even know I had these beliefs. Where did I even get these beliefs from? I, like they, I actually don't truly believe that. Um, and then once we've unpacked that all and, and I guess gotten comfortable with like I can be and do anything I essentially want to because I'm not attached or I'm not, uh, I don't have to be uh, this person or, you know, it, you know, you have some sort of choice in the matter. Then we can start to re <laughs> go back from the, so I see it as going from the outside in. So that's why we're like kind of like deepening through the layers to the core of our essence and who we are. Um, and then once we kind of have a bit more of an idea of what that is, uh, then we can start to rebuild ourselves from the ground up in, in a conscious fashion and choose, you know, what beliefs we want. And um, yeah, and it's, you know, it's not just a linear path. We don't just unpack everything and then rebuild ourselves and then we're done. It's constantly unpacking and then rebuilding, unpacking, rebuilding. It's like, again, with, you know, the Marie Kondo thing, you don't just like, you know, you, you find things that work and you change over time and evolve. So it's a constant, constant cyclical um, process. Uh, and so how do we do this? We do this with a lot of um, breath work practices, um, you know, physical asana based practices, a lot of meditation, mantra, uh, visualization exercises, working with archetypes and deities. But uh, the main process that we do to, uh, through, through all this is with the work of the five elements, which is a, a much more traditional tantric chakra system um, of the five elements. And we even see this in the modern chakra system when you, you know, have the mantras like lum and vum and rum and yum and even om, these are more related to, well, they are related to the elements, the five elements, but then they later got installed into the seven chakra rainbow system. And so you still find those mantras, the elemental mantras and the associations with elements in the seven chakra system, but the seven chakra system is an entirely modern uh, framework, a 20th century one. Again, you can go back to my previous podcast about that. Um, so yeah, so purifying and integrating the five, you know, holy elements is the way that we start to, because these five elements kind of operate in the gaps between these six layers. And this is how we kind of weave everything together and start to play. And, you know, it, it's a fun way of doing it. I mean, everyone, you know, who anyone who grew up with like watching, uh, like, you know, into fantasy and, and magic and pretty much any anyone in the world, I was going to say Western world, but in the world has probably heard of the five elements, right? I mean, I love Avatar The Last Airbender. And so to explore our soul and explore who we are and to develop ourselves in the world um, while using these like, you know, playing with elements and stuff like that, it's just not only such a beneficial uh, beautiful thing to do, um, and, and f like I think one of the most important things that humans can do, but it's such a fun way of doing it because um, every culture has slightly different versions of how to do this, and I just think this uh, tantric yoga way of doing it is, is, to be honest, one of the most fun that I've ever, um, yeah, I've ever found. And so the last part of all this is what also distinguishes 
Tantra or this particular tantric path or our yoga teacher training as opposed to what you might find in others is that a lot of yoga traditions or even tantric traditions talk a lot about moving kundalini up the body whereas you know we do that but you can see moving kundalini up the body as unpacking the layers and this is what you know a lot of people talk about ascending ascending into the 5d or ascending like in general right going up the chakras like in my perspective what that is is it's actually unpacking because the elements that are installed in the body as chakras um but what we're doing first we're moving up through the elements so we're going from solid earth to this watery liquid flexibility substance to then combusting and kind of like uh seeing uh fire as this opportunity to tra- mix and transform and then wind it becomes this free moving uh essence to then we open up to space or the void um, as infinite possibility and so then so that's moving up that's kundalini moving up so it's it's unpacking all the different layers and saying that nothing is actually permanent that we can we can choose and change and transform things but then a lot of people want to stay up there right so they're like oh wow i'm just in this beautiful blissful state so that's fine but then what are you go- how are you going to implement that into your day-to-day life and we we're almost going back to exactly where i started this conversation where you have this amazing realization that, oh, I really want to eat healthier. I really want to do this. I really, wow, I loved, uh, you know, going roller skating, let's say, I don't know. And you want to make it more of a part of your life, but then you don't because you're too much in a, in a habit or something like that. And so that's going upwards. That's Kundalini going up. You have this realization. The more that Kundalini goes up, the more expanded your awareness and your ideas can become. So it can infinitely go up, but it, then it can also infinitely go down. So what is Kundalini moving down? Kundalini moving down is implementing these realizations into your body and into the world as constants and as sustainable things and the problem is that most people are just having these realizations and living in you know the ethereal or in in the head in their awareness body without actually making the changes in their lives they constantly are like you know almost living in a bit of a fantasy now you know if that makes your if you're having these fantastical experiences and ideas and you know a lot of people do plant medicine for these kind of experiences which i'm a big advocate for and and i I support and have done myself but then once you have these realizations what are you going to do with these realizations and so what, what i find is missing in a lot of the yoga world and the tantric world even is is practical tools to allow you to implement these changes into sustainable and constant parts of your body and your life and your relationships and and even the mysterious force of the world around you and what people call manifesting and magic and interacting with the the universe and the cosmos how can we do this on a practical consistent way and this is what we're doing so yes we are like ascending and evolving and growing and unpacking stuff but then we bring it back down to earth once we've learned our lessons and we do this as again as a cyclical process we're always unpacking so in our tantric model kundalini is always synchronous um syn- Synchronously, I'm trying to think of the right word for it. It's basically at the same time. <laughs> I'm trying to use a big word, but it just failed badly. Um, yeah, we're syncing up at the same time with the Kundalini moving up and down at all times, basically. So, yeah, that's that's I think the main difference that I see w- with a lot of other schools or traditions. They're like, yeah, we need to ascend, we need to get the Kundalini up, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, we're doing both, yeah. We're we're wanting to expand our awareness constantly and get more aware of ourselves and have these beautiful, blissful, um, you know, oneness experiences. But then we want to also bring these experiences and down back into the real world, uh, or you know, not necessarily real world, but into the physical world, into our physical body. But that's why even starting to be able to use these layers and use these bindus and concepts and elements as a language. So now with our you know, my teacher trainees, I can just say, yeah, you know, like I'm, I'm very much like in the watery kind of aspect of this thing at the moment and I need to bring it more down to earth or maybe I need to go back to fire and kind of like re-approach uh, it differently. And, um, you know, like I'm operating mainly out of chitta right now, which is like the, the kind of like 
uh, intellectual, emotional headspace, and I, I want to, you know, deepen my experience of it more into the pranic realm. I know it, this doesn't mean much to you now, but this is like, you know, when you're in the club, this is how you get to talk. <laughs> but you kind of do, and this is what language is for. These are just basically building a model or building an explanation for these experiences, which everyone kind of has on some level, um, but they don't know how to talk about it. They don't know how to experience it. And this is, I guess, what I was kind of making jokes of like at the start of this podcast uh, with that little, you know, that little parody satire ad thing that people throw these terms around a lot, but not really knowing what they mean or having an embodied experience of them or even asking each other or themselves what they actually mean by these things. Because even though we use the same terms and use the same names for things and words for things, we probably have, you know, if, if anything that I've said so far is valid, is that we're probably experiencing them at least slightly differently. And that's kind of the point. Um, so we can share with this with each other. And, you know, if you listen to a lot of what I say, like my big goal of mine and a big goal, I think, of this lineage of yoga and, and this is to try to invite more compassion and collaboration and mutual respect because the whole point of the cosmos, you know, dancing with itself is to experience slightly different perspectives um, and to learn and grow from that. And I think that what we're doing here at Ritual Embodiment and the House of Majors and, um, and now these new students and teachers that are coming out are bringing more of this into the world. And again, it's not the way. <laughs> I don't think anything is the way, it is just a way. Um, I think it is a great way, obviously. Um, I'm very biased. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm also growing and evolving and learning and um, yeah, and slightly changing my perspective over time. And yeah, if you ask me to do the same podcast essentially in five years, it would probably be different or who knows. So yeah, that's a, a bit of a, you know, I always aim for these to be short, but I did have a lot to say on this subject. And um, yeah, there's so many more tangents I could have gone on and I will unpack more in future episodes or some of these I already have gone into on past episodes. So please, yeah, definitely check out some of the past episodes that I've done if you want to dive more. I'll link them if they're relevant down in the show notes. And uh, yeah, if you want to know more about myself, Daniel Arulian Cumming, uh, what I do, or what the House of Majors does, which is a school of yoga, tantra, and the magical arts, and um, really helping to reforge the link between yoga and magic, and ritual embodiment is a full 200-hour yoga alliance, uh, recognized and qualified, certified yoga teacher training program that is focused on traditional classical tantric yoga with a bit of a um, magical spin on it and also highly influenced by vinyasa and hatha yoga. And um, I have quite a background in Tai Chi and Qigong practices as well, which um, flow in very, very nicely with it all in the movement side of things uh, and the pranayama side of certain things as well. So um, thehouseofmages.com um, is the place that you can go for all that info. And you can also find me at daniel.arulian. That's on uh, Instagram or Facebook. Other than that, uh, yeah, just go the links in the show notes. I also have a YouTube channel if you want to do some of my classes. Uh, that's it under Rune Yoga. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. But yeah, thank you so much for bearing with me, for listening, for being a part of this. And yeah, I feel like there's a lot of uh, info in here. So yeah, this is definitely one of those episodes that uh, you might want to re-listen to a couple of times um, because it is so dense. Uh, and I'm not just saying that to get the extra plays, although I do appreciate that. And yeah, please feel free. And I'd really appreciate it if you share this podcast with anyone who you think might benefit from it or would be interested in it. And yeah, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it shed a bit of light on how I view yoga and Tantra and a bit of lightheartedness to the whole approach as well and inclusiveness and yeah and if you are considering uh, joining us um, for the ritual embodiment yoga teacher training that it's given you a bit of a perspective on how we do approach things a little bit differently to most and what we're trying to achieve here and the amazing framework that we've got to support you all the way through because 
yeah, I feel like so many people just throw information out there without a way of organizing it. But having a framework like this with the, you know, the three uh, bodies, the bindus, the six layers and the five elements of bringing it all together is a way of kind of like storing information so you can everything that we learn can kind of be attributed to these different layers and elements and it's kind of like storage boxes or like a, a kind of framework to hang everything on a skeleton to keep everything up and um <laughs> in its place so to speak so yeah anyway thank you again uh and i will speak to you soon make yoga magic again